Uh, I really do feel tonight like I come from the epicenter of an, a political earthquake and that epicenter is in Berlin where politically the earth is really shaking tonight. We Prime Minister uh, Papandreou is meeting with Chancellor Merkel while we speak. Before uh, their talk Papandreou said um, we are determined to do what is necessary and Merkel said we are ready to help, we want a strong Greece in the Eurozone. And what a political week in Germany, and what a week for Europe, and what a week for Angela Merkel. It's showdown time for the most powerful woman of the world. That's at least what Forbes magazine says about the German Chancellor. This week she will have to prove it at home and to those who think so highly of her that they give, that they give her this awesome title. As you know, she is 57 years old, she grew up in communist Eastern Germany, she knew Western democracy during the first 37 years of her life only from television, and today she is on the cover of leading magazines. Now, does she deserve this title? Is the German Federal Chancellor able to lead? Can Germany really lead in a time of extreme uncertainty? Now, let's take a closer look together. As everybody in this room knows, Germany, Germany is really the strongest economy of Europe. For many years, the country with its 82 million inhabitants was the strongest export nation on this globe. Now it is still number two next to China with over a billion people. And now, let's stay with these good news for quite a while. 2008 was the year of the worldwide financial crisis, also for Germany. German gross national product was reduced by about 5%. The future seemed very dark for the German economy, which depends strongly on the state of the world economy. Angela Merkel said over and over again, this crisis is tough, it will continue for a long time. At that point, the huge advantage of the German system became obvious, which is strongly based, especially in times of crisis, on consensus. Germany got lucky because of the fact that a grand coalition from Christian Democrats and Social Democrats governed the country at that point. Under the leadership of Angela Merkel, both big parties who determined the destiny of Germany during the past 60 years were in power together. This government did three important things. It stabilized the banking system, it guaranteed that the people's savings in their bank in their bank accounts and Angela Merkel resisted very personally the demand from US President Obama to pump mad sums of fresh money into the economy. A moderate program of state aid in the stimulus package made it possible for the German industry not to have to fire their skilled workers. The workers had to give up part of their income, the working hours were shortened, the trade unions joined in, which was very important so that these workers could keep their jobs. If you look back at the six years of her time as Chancellor, this was certainly Angela Merkel's best time. She has the ability to be a good moderator. She was able to bring together the positions of both big parties and unite them. Moreover, it paid off. And here the trade unions also played an important role that these workers received only very moderate pay raises already during the past 20 years since German reunification, which hardly exceeded the very low inflation rate. This clearly allowed the German industry to improve its productivity and its international competitiveness. Germany was able to keep her industrial base the most important reason what the country is doing so well. Germany, as you know, is a high-tech country, but we also still produce bolts and nuts and did not move all jobs to China. Although, of course, the German economy too strongly invests in China and many other countries and produces there. Here in this audience, everybody knows the big players on the world stage, like Bayer, Lanxess, Siemens, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, Porsche, some of them have their American headquarters right here in Pittsburgh. But the most important employer in Germany is the so-called Mittelstand, small and mid-sized enterprises with 50, 100, 1,000 or maybe 2,000 employees 
very often they are still owned by families and with a tight relationship between the workers and the management. Many of these companies are world market leaders in their area. They are flexible and creative. Most are concentrated in the south of Germany. Especially these companies profited from the fact that they, supported by the federal government, were able to keep their skilled workforce. And when the world economy recovered relatively fast, they could jumpstart their production again. As you know, during the 60s of the past century, Germany has experienced the first big economic miracle. And I think it is fair to say, after the financial crisis of 2008, we now see the second German economic miracle. The economy is growing by about 3% this year. It's slowing down a bit after a healthy growth last year. The unemployment rate under the government of Gerhard Schröder, still at almost 5 million, has been reduced to less than 3 million, which equals about 7%. And it will fall further, so much further that very soon we'll see the biggest challenge for Germany, the lack of people in general and the lack of skilled workers in particular. And now, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we will have to leave the good news for a while. Germany, this mighty country in the heart of Europe, is dramatically shrinking. Allow me to stay for some time with this important topic, which does not get much attention abroad or even at home. While the U.S. is continuing to grow, the growth deficit in Germany will amount in a few years to millions of people. The worst case scenario assumes that the population of 82 million will drop to only 50 million people in 2050, and other model expects 69 million at that point in time. And the reason is very obvious. The birth rate amounts to only 1.4 children per woman. This has, of course, dramatic effects on the social systems. Age poverty is, is uh, one of the big dangers on the horizon. Germany will by no means be able to prevent this from happening by just telling young families, okay, just have more kids and all will be well. The government is trying very hard by spending huge amounts of money for kindergartens and other incentives for parents. But A, it is not working, the birth rate is hardly increasing, or not at all, and B, it is too late for this. Another figure exposes the problem for the economy clearly. Experts assume that in 2025 there will be a lack of up to 6.5 million skilled workers. This is in only 14 years from now, with about 40 million current jobs. Germany will have a gigantic problem to maintain her prosperity. The solution sounds easy, but unfortunately, in the complicated reality of German politics, it is not. Germany needs massive immigration. This is the only solution. We do not talk about thousands, we do not talk about hundreds of thousands, we talk about millions of people. The official number of foreigners amounts currently to 7 million people. By now, however, about 15 million people with foreign roots are living in Germany. Many of, them, many of them have a German passport and live here in the second or third generation. Among them are about 4 million Muslims. That obviously creates huge problems with the integration of these people. In the schools in some parts in big German cities the proportion of immigrant children amounts to 80, sometimes even 90 percent. In the federal state of Baden-Württemberg, one of the most affluent German states, every fourth citizen already has foreign roots. This affects everyday life in many areas, also in the media or in politics. The chairman of the Green Party, called Cem Özdemir, for example, has Turkish roots, and the chairman of the Free Democrats with at the same time the Vice Chancellor and the Federal Minister for, for Economic Affairs in Angela Merkel's cabinet comes from Vietnam. He, had, he was adopted by German parents as a child. 
though the German political class has accepted in the meantime ever so reluctantly that Germany is an immigration country, ordinary people are not ready yet to accept this too. Still it is clear, without massive immigration Germany becomes a country of senior citizens, many of whom must live in poverty, while at the same time losing its position as technological world leader in many fields. Ladies and gentlemen, the question is not do we need immigration, but only which immigration. This, of course, is easier said than done. For a long time, there is an international race going on for the brightest minds, and it does not look like Germany right now is among the winners. Many barriers in the, head, in the heads of the Germans must still be removed. The survey has shown that resentments are especially strong towards immigrants from Muslim countries. 59% said that the majority of the Muslims is not ready to accept the values of the German constitution for themselves. At the moment, the government is considering reducing the income threshold, which amounts currently to 60,000 euros per year for skilled workers who are from abroad, those who come from outside the European Union. If you come from inside the EU, you are welcome to come now without restrictions. However, many skilled immigrants do not come to Germany because they fear, on one hand, resentments and fail, on the other hand, because of the linguistic barrier. They rather go to English-speaking countries like the US, Canada or Australia. In any case, it is clear, without a solution of the immigration problem, Germany will have no future. Another pressing problem that Germany is obviously sharing with most other countries in the world, including the US, is this. We spend more than we earn. The national debt amounts to 24,000 euro for every German citizen. But German politics has finally understood this central problem and has made an important step to tame it. The vast majority in the Bundestag, the German parliament, the constitution has been changed and has inserted a so-called debt break. This means that the government will have to bring down the budget deficit till 2016 to almost zero. So in only five years from now, that must be achieved. Right now, it looks like Germany will be able to do this. But a big if remains. And now we'll have to face some more bad news. The international financial crisis, which started right here in the US with the breakdown of Lehman Brothers, was hardly over when the Greek crisis, which I'd like to call a Greek tragedy, started, emerging into a European crisis which lasts till today and which is open-ended. In the spring of 2010, it became finally obvious what should have been clear much earlier. Eight million Greeks were living beyond their means in a completely irresponsible way. They should never, ever have been accepted into the Eurozone, which consists of 17 states, because they simply did not qualify. While the Greek, but also a number of other European states, including the opposition in Germany, demanded a quick helping hand from the rich Germans, Chancellor Angela Merkel tried to stall for quite a while. First, she said, the Greeks had to do their homework and make a credible effort to reform their truly incredible system in which, for example, regular tax collection seemed to be unknown. Critics accuse Merkel of having worsened the crisis by doing this, making it more expensive for Greece to get financial aid on the international money market. Like any other politician, Merkel had to take a hard look at the situation back home last year. She was facing elections in the largest and most important German state, North Rhine-Westphalia, and financial aid for foreign countries with German taxpayers' money was highly unpopular. Germans who lost their money and their currency twice in the past century are much more sensitive than people in other countries they had to give up their hard Deutsche Mark again for the European currency, the Euro, only 10 years ago, and many regret this till today. 
Germans today are full of fear to be held responsible for the debt all over Europe. A concern that is all too understandable if you look at the situation in a number of countries around us. Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats have lost this crucial state election last year anyway. A hard blow for a government which lost its majority in the Bundesrat, the second uh, chamber of the parliament, and is now depending in many crucial areas on having to find a compromise, just like President Obama has to do in the House. In the meantime, she had to give up her strict wait-and-see positions bit by bit, while the European Union unfolded new so-called rescue umbrellas for countries in need. Because Germany is the biggest country in the Union, it also had to take over the biggest share of these financial guarantees. At the moment we speak of the enlargement of this rescue umbrella to more than 700 billion euro. The German portion amounts to, to, uh, to uh, 211 billion euros. The German federal budget is only around 300 billion so that explains the dimension of the debate. That too uh, would enable the fund to actually pay out 400, uh, 440 billion euros for countries in need. Today there was talk in Berlin about even enlarging that fund greatly, which made lawmakers extremely nervous, much more nervous than they, are already, than they already are. Finance Minister Schäuble today flatly denied this, saying it would be a stupid idea. Up to now, it is a matter of only guaranteeing this sum, but what will happen if states of the Eurozone go really belly up? This is the real concern which causes sleepless nights for the representatives in the Bundestag. What if Germany must really pay up a horror image for many? Bye-bye balanced budgets, bye-bye happiness in the next elections. Their voters have clearly said to their representatives, we do not want to become the paymasters of Europe. We do not want the EU to become a transfer union in which the strong, that means of course above all Germany, must stand in permanently for the mistakes of the weak. Therefore, Angela Merkel had to, face, or had to face almost a revolution in her own camp. For weeks now, she, she has to fight for her political life. Her, her, her coalition of Christian Democrats and Free Democrats is in serious danger to fall apart. In the polls, the Free Democrats are in a free fall because they have lost all credibility by promising tax cuts which they cannot deliver. They had to fire their chairman, Video Westerwelle, because of this a man who is now barely surviving as foreign minister, still having to take the blame for the devastating figures in the polls and in recent regional elections. <coughs> Only a few days ago, we had two more of these regional state elections, the very latest in the nation's capital, Berlin. Berlin is not just Germany's biggest city, but technically also a state. And the Free Democrats only got 1.8% of the votes. We just cannot get lower than that, considering the fact uh, that, uh, that they got an incredible 15% only two years ago in the national elections. They felt really extremely strong back then, but that is history now. In a last-minute effort, they kind of tried the anti-Greek card, which in fact came across as kind of anti-European. They said, let Greece go into an orderly bankruptcy. In other words, a very populist approach. This message did not work either. The voters just did not buy it. Now the Free Democrats are so incredibly weakened, they have a hard time to, to, to be taken seriously within the federal government. In her own party, Angela Merkel is facing unrest because many older members accuse her of being not conservative enough, of having no vision, of giving no clear direction to the party. Against this backdrop, Angela Merkel must now find a majority in her own camp to finally pass this rescue umbrella in 
the Bundestag this week, actually this Thursday. Many of the representatives in the ruling coalition argue that the parliament must have more rights if they are asked to decide about billions of German tax money. The government cannot just dictate what we have to do. They cannot just make new commitments in Europe all the time without our consent. That's the bottom line of their concern. Last week, the coalition gave in to that concern and granted the Bundestag indeed more rights. The more than symbolic fight is also about so-called euro bonds, bonds that weak states in the eurozone could use to get cheap money through cheaper interest rates. For countries like Greece, with a bad financial rating, high interest rates would go down. For Germany, with a good rating, these interest rates would go up. In other words, Germany would be a big loser in this game. Mer Merkel got that message and has excluded the introduction of euro bonds, at least for now. But she remains under heavy pressure abroad and in opposition circles to allow them anyway. This week, the big showdown will come. We are already in the middle of it. Angela Merkel has to finally convince the representatives of her own coalition to give her that absolute majority without the help of the opposition who favors the rescue plan. The Merkel government has a majority of 19 votes in the Bundestag. And if she does not get these 19 votes, Angela Merkel is politically finished. That's what most commentators said in Berlin. Last week, she and others kind of gave, gave up on this goal. Her helpers, among them Finance Minister Schäuble, said, don't worry about that majority for the coalition. We'll be able to get a majority in the parliament anyway, because the opposition also supports the health package Therefore, we cannot lose that vote. A clear sign of weakness because the government is depending on the votes of the opposition camp on such an important decision. Tonight, there is talk in Berlin that a number of uh, representatives of Merkel's camp are, are about to change their mind to maybe give her this uh, majority of her own anyway, but we'll have to wait and see. The New York Times said, Europe's fate is resting on Merkel's shoulders. This week is therefore probably the most critical moment in the chancellery of Angela Merkel. She has been forced to take a stand. She is defending the Euro and Europe, standing accused by even the man who once discovered her of having no clear compass. That's what former, Ch that's what former Chancellor Helmut Kohl recently said about her. Merkel finally came around saying this in an interview and I quote her, therefore it is our top priority to avoid an uncontrolled default because it would hit many other countries, end of quote. That indeed is the major concern that not just the Greece but larger, much larger countries could get infected by this disease. On Sunday night she, she started the ultimate offensive. In an hour-long nationwide interview on ARD-TV, the network I work for, she said that the stability of the euro in general is on the line. If Europe does not act now, there would be a complete loss of trust of investors in the euro. She asked her critics to pass the provisional protection umbrella to be replaced by a permanent one in 2013, when the, euro when the eurozone countries want to have a tool in place that can protect them with even more financial guarantees by the member states. Merkel demanded a more aggressive stand against countries that deal with the debt in an irresponsible way. And she even went so far to ask for new provisions to take them to the European Court to impose tough sanctions. Yesterday night she went one step further, saying the EU should have the right to avoid or to cancel national budgets of member states if they do not maintain financial discipline. In other words, um, the, the, in other words, really interfere with the rights of sovereign states. That definitely was harsh language and tells you how serious the situation is, not just for Angela Merkel, but also for the Euro and Europe in general. 
It is therefore a critical moment for Europe, and it is not only about money. It is, on one hand, about the big European idea, about the future of a free Europe without borders and without enemies. But a unified Europe is also about free trade. It is therefore also about the interest of the German industry and about the interest of all Germans, because more than 60% of all exports do not go to China, India, or the US, but to countries of the European Union. The Union is the most important trading partner of Germany. Without Europe, Germany can also not maintain her prosperity. Overall, exhaustion is being felt in the European Union at uh, the moment. The challenges are too big, not only because of the financial problems, which by no means only concern Greece, Ireland, or Portugal, but also big states like Spain or even Italy. Moreover, Europe has not yet digested the effects of the latest enlargement round. If one looks back critically, Bulgaria and Romania, with their deficits, with the rule of law, with corruption and other related problems, have been accepted into the EU absolutely too early. Next in line is Croatia, and then everybody else will probably, will, will probably have to wait for a long, long, long time. Also, the European institutions we have been created according to the Lisbon Treaty with the aim to improve European foreign affairs do not function really well. European diplomats complain that now it has become even more difficult to function together in Europe. The dream of the United States of Europe will not become a reality anytime soon. That is for sure. Also, there will be no common European economic government as promised by Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy recently, but merely more consultations on an intergovernmental level on this subject. So now, if we ask ourselves, is there leadership by Angela Merkel? The answer is yes, in the sense that she over and over again spells conditions for financial help and demands from other European states that they do their homework in, that they do their homework, homework and indeed slowly the idea of a balanced budget and the debt reduction gains popularity in other European capitals. To her credit, one must add that she strongly opposed the idea to push Greece out of the Eurozone. Now, let me say this. I am too old to have heard the catchword European crisis already so many times. It is almost as old as the European Union and reappears over and over again. One can actually count on this. However, allow me to say that I have grown up as a child of the Cold War, surrounded by enemies in the East and neighbors in the West, traumatized by the German occupation during the World War. And I say, considering that history, in spite of all skepticism, today's Europe is seen in this historic context an inconceivable success story. Peace for Europe without borders, like one, like one could travel between Pittsburgh or Miami with a common currency like the US dollar, a currency which in spite of all problems remains strong which you can test yourself if you travel to Europe with your dollars. One should never forget this, even if progress is slow in the European unification process right now. In this situation, the strongest country in Europe currently under the direction of Angela Merkel try, tries to find a compass for her relationship with the rest of the world. So, September 11, 2001 was a terrible attack but it was an important stepping stone for a new direction for German foreign policy. While Germany was used during the Cold War to look for Big Brother USA to protect it against the big Soviet bear, September 11 was payback time. Germany promised America unlimited solidarity in the fight against terrorism. For an American, it may be nothing unusual 
if the country goes to war. For a German born after the Second World War, this is something very unusual. To make this clear, permit me a small excursion into my own personal history. As an innocent boy born in 1947, I'd like to play as a child, like all other children, cowboy and Indian, and had a small, harmless toy gun. My father was absolutely against it. He said I was forced to be a soldier uh, during the war for six years. I have held enough weapons in my hand for the rest of my life and for my whole family too. This was a feeling that was shared by millions of Germans. Never again war, never again a holocaust, never again rearming. This was the motto of this war generation. And as you know, it turned out differently. Divided Germany had to rearm itself again against the Soviet menace. It became a member in NATO. It built up big armed forces, but always remained under the big umbrella of Big Brother USA. But this pacifistic mentality is deeply rooted in the German psyche till this day. The German constitution has provided that every German military action abroad must be approved first by the Bundestag. No federal chancellor can take part, can take part in a war without this approval. The attack on Se September 11, 2001 was so horrifying that Chancellor Gerhard Schröder could push through the German participation in the Afghanistan war on the side of America. But only one year later, he refused to take part in the Iraq war. This has led to heavy irritations and tensions in the German-American relationship, but his decision against the war made Schroeder popular and contributed substantially to the fact that he was re-elected in 2002. Against this background, a decision this year by the Merkel government has to be judged, which has also led to heavy irritations with the partners in Europe as well as in America. Germany has welcomed the Arabian Spring, but when the people in Libya rose against Muhammad al-Gaddafi, Germany made it a point to refuse to take part in a NATO military action. Again, elections in two important German states were looming, and so the Merkel government wanted to stay out of this military action. Foreign Minister Westerwelle ordered the German ambassador to abstain in the Security Council of the United Nations, together with China and Russia, and against the Allies, USA, France and Great Britain, a vote that amounted in reality to a no. Germany has not, as you know, taken part in air raids against Gaddafi's army, and besides, once more, has listened to a critical population which does not want a bigger military role in the world. The, partic the participation of German soldiers in the war in Afghanistan remains very unpopular. About 80% of the Germans are against it. Germany will basically follow America's lead uh, and start a drawdown of its 5,000 troops this year, hoping to complete it by 2014, but it will be a very modest drawdown. But the catch is this, Germany is depending on the support of American assets, especially combat on many back helicopters in the north of Afghanistan. If the Americans withdraw that support, it will be very hard to maintain German military power there. In turn, other allies with smaller contingents, like the Norwegians, the Swedish, and other nations, have made it clear that they depend on the Germans and will be forced to give their forces up if the Germans cannot maintain their current military engagement, which, as I have stated already, they cannot do without the U.S. support. I just returned from another trip to Afghanistan a week ago and can report to you that the situation is still very complex. We certainly see progress in a number of areas. The building up of, Af of Afghan national forces continues. All military operations of the German troops are now conducted together with Afghan troops. 
Taliban are no longer able to go into open combat, yet they can still do much psychological damage with spectacular attacks against targets, targets even in Kabul, which they only recently have demonstrated so clearly. In the north of Afghanistan, which is the area of German military responsibility, only 3% of all hostile incidents occur, yet the German general who is commanding officer for the Allied troops in this area told me that there is still no single day without enemy fire. I talked for some time with a US commander on the ground and we both agreed that it is very hard to give folks back home a real picture of what is happening over there. Nevertheless, it is clear Germany will stay a reliable partner, a partner in Afghanistan and will not hasten to go home real quick. Ex expect some kind of military engagement even beyond 2014. While Germany's role in Afghanistan was never in doubt, it sure was in Libya, as I stated already. After the Libya decision at the UN, German diplomats and also the community of foreign affairs experts were and are outraged about this German Sonderweg or unique cause of action which has done much harm around the globe. Yet, Foreign Minister Westerwelle strictly stated with his view that the German demands for economic sanctions had contributed to the breakdown of the Gaddafi regime and not NATO's massive air raids. And this was too much even for a critical German public that did not support German military action. The unpopular German foreign minister truly has become an endangered species it is by no means clear that he will last very long, given the fact that his own party is highly critical of him. Merkel herself and others in her government felt obliged to praise NATO airstrikes a few days ago to limit this damage. Yet, she stands accused even by the man who once discovered her former chancellor, Helmut Kohl. Critics see another clue for a German Sonderweg of this unique cause of action. Almost exactly one year ago, the Merkel government has extended the life of the German nuclear power stations by about 30 years. But only half a year later, after the earthquake in Japan, which has destroyed the nuclear power station in Fukushima, came a turnabout inconceivable before that nuclear disaster. The very same Merkel government got out of nuclear energy real quick. In 2022, so in about 10 years, all 17 German nuclear power stations will be completely turned off. Eight have already been switched off. With this decision, Germany is the only country which reacts in such a drastic manner to that nuclear accident without consulting with their European partners. The French, who rely on nuclear energy almost completely, have complained about this only a few days ago. Germany will be surrounded in the future by states in which nuclear energy continues to exist. This can go into two directions. German, indus German industry will suffer heavy damage because of higher energy prices, or the German industry can further evolve as the world market leader for green technologies and leave behind all the other countries with their nuclear energy. So let's wait and see. Now, again, is Angela Merkel a leader? Yes, she is in this field anyway. She again followed the will of a population which wants it this way. Germans are traditionally against nuclear energy. Now Merkel practically overnight vote to this pressure. Germans have isolated themselves in this area, however, internationally. So, where is Germany moving to? Which direction is it taking? The Merkel government wants to remain at the side of, uh, of America and the traditional allies in Europe. The relationship between her and President Obama is in order. Many telephone calls and video conferences take place. Consultations are closed between both of them. 
In a speech a few days ago, Merkel stressed again this close relationship with the United States. Germany would and could never solve conflicts in this, in this globalized world alone, she said. All of us, including the US, are depending on working relations, uh, relationships and alliances. I quote her, the partnership with America and the trans transatlantic alliance are still the pillars of our foreign policy, end of quote. That sounds good, there is no real reason to doubt it. You can hear the same remarks by American diplomats in Berlin. But Germany is currently on the way to new shores. The Chancellor's office in the halls of the Foreign Office on things about the new world order. The old one has passed in 1989 at the end of the Cold War. The new one is on the horizon. And therefore, Germany also wants to turn towards this new world order, this new strategic partnerships with countries like China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and Russia. Do, neglect, do not neglect old partnerships, but look for new partners and deepen the relationship. This is the model. Germany is at a crossroads. It wants to remain in the Atlantic Alliance. It wants to be part of this alliance of common defense and common values. And this is a lot. But the times in which Germany followed the guidance of America more or less blindly, these times are finally over. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, in my own family, we live a good German-American relationship every day. Our son, Nicholas Alexander, was born on July 18, 1993, in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Now, he has two passports, one American and one German. So whatever happens to Angela Merkel or Barack Obama, when he grows up, he could follow both. He could become German Chancellor and then American President, or the other way around, whatever comes first. Wouldn't that be something? Thank you very much for your time.